So today on Artist Talk, we got Ben Mesrick. Ben is the author responsible for accidental billionaires and bringing down the house. So do you identify with these guys? I definitely do. I mean, I, I love the whole Robin Hood or David versus Goliath kind of theme. The idea of young, smart people taking on an evil institution, or not necessarily evil, but like the casino. I mean, the casino is this giant, massive organization built to take your money. I love casinos and I spend a lot of time in them, but they try and trick you. I mean, everything in the casino is designed to take your money. From the carpets they choose, which are purposefully ugly so you keep your eyes up, to the lights, to the buzzers, they do tons of studies on what lights make you spend more money, and to the aromatherapy. There's actual you know, smells that make you spend more money. All of these things are researched. So the idea of these Davids going on against that kind of bad Goliath is really a turn on to me and I love the idea of, 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 of young people taking on the system. You know, I never set out to be a nonfiction writer. Nonfiction was ever, never that interesting to me. Uh, I, I loved television, especially really bad TV. Um, and I used to just sit at home and watch television and so my parents installed a rule at home when I was a kid that we had to read two books a week before we were allowed to watch TV. So I became a speed reader um, so that I could watch TV. And uh, when I graduated from college, I decided I wanted to be a writer, so I locked myself in a room in Boston where I live, and I wrote nine novels, um, and they were really crappy, and they were deep, dark stories that took place in bars in New York City, um, because that's what I thought writers wrote. And consequently, I was rejected by everyone in publishing. I got about 190 rejection slips, and I had them all over my walls. I was even rejected by a janitor at a publishing house, because I sent to an editor who no longer worked there, and the janitor pulled it out of the garbage can and read it and then rejected me. So uh, it shows you how well I was writing. I started hanging out in a bar in Boston, and this bar was called Crossroads. And it was your average kind of dive bar, except for it was right next to the school MIT, where all the geeky science guys were. And there was a group of college students who hung out there, and they looked like every other MIT kid, except for they had tons of money. And it was always in $100 bills. And so I went up to the main kid, and I was like, why do you have so much money, and why is it in hundreds? So he invites me to his house, and I get there, and stacked in his laundry was $250,000 in banded stacks of $100 bills. And I said, okay, this kid's got to be a drug dealer, right? But he was this smart math science kid. He just didn't look like a drug dealer. So I said, why do you have a quarter million dollars in your laundry? And he invited me to Vegas. So the next day, I got on a plane with him and five of his buddies, and they were all sitting in separate seats, and they were all pretending that they didn't know each other. And we landed in Las Vegas, and there was a uniform driver in a big stretch limo. He picked us up. He brings us to this huge suite with a swimming pool. We had a butler. We didn't even know what to do with it, but we had a butler. And all the MIT kids, they start coming into the room, and they start pulling money out from under their clothes. And they had flown with a million dollars in cash, had spread it out among them, flown to Vegas. They piled it up on the table in the suite, and they said, we're the MIT blackjack team. So I joined the MIT Blackjack team. I started going to Vegas every weekend, and I wrote the story that became the movie 21, um, the Vegas movie, which a lot of you have probably seen. I, I wrote the story, and I was sitting at home, and the book was about to come out, and the phone rings, and it's Kevin Spacey, the actor. And at first, I didn't believe it was Kevin Spacey. I actually hung up on him, and I called my mom, and I said, I think Kevin Spacey's trying to call me. And she said, no, it's those MIT kids prank calling you, because they used to prank call me all the time. But it actually was Kevin, and he said, I want to make a movie out of this. So I said, sure. So we took it out to all the, uh, all the Hollywood movie studios, and they all turned it down, except for MGM, which coincidentally was the casino that we had been hitting over the past two years. <laughs> I knew what Facebook was. Like everyone else, I was on Facebook, mainly because my wife is obsessed with Facebook, and so I wanted to see what pictures she was posting, and if there was anything embarrassing that I needed to tell her to take down. So I sit down, and in walks Eduardo Saverin. Um, and Eduardo was angry, really, really angry. He was also a little drunk, but he was angry. And he wanted to tell me about Mark Zuckerberg, and how Mark Zuckerberg had screwed him. And that's how he started the conversation. But it was a really wild story. These two were geeky kids. They were outsiders. They were math science geeks. Uh, Eduardo had made a bunch of money because he was obsessed with meteorology and weather. 
and he had made all this money trading oil futures following weather patterns, and Mark was a hacker. I mean, these were your ultimate geeky kids. And they wanted to be parts of these finals clubs. Eduardo really wanted to be a member of one of these secret societies at Harvard, the finals clubs. They're kind of these social institutions. Mark wasn't able to get in as well. And uh, late one night after a really bad date, Mark came home, was drinking some beers, hacked into all the computers at Harvard, pulled up pictures of every girl on campus, and made a website where you could vote on who the hottest girl at Harvard was. And he emailed it to a couple of friends. It was just a joke. It ends up spreading all over campus. Everyone tries to log in at the same time. It crashes the computer servers at Harvard, and Mark gets in a lot of trouble. And he didn't even know why he was in trouble. To him, it wasn't a misogynistic thing. He, he didn't do anything. It was just kind of to show you what he could do. But Harvard was very upset at him, and they nearly kicked him out. I write a 14-page book proposal. I'm about to send it out, and it leaks onto the web on a site called gawker.com. They print my entire book proposal. I've never seen this before. Suddenly, everything explodes. Facebook gets really, really pissed off. I think there's some people here from Facebook, and they might hate me. But Facebook gets really, really pissed off. I get all these phone calls. What are you doing? You know, I spend a year trying to talk to Mark. Mark will not talk to me. I'm trying to talk to him. He knows I'm talking to Eduardo. He just doesn't want me telling his story. This is not the story he ever wanted to tell, and I understand that. This story is a lot from Eduardo's point of view. It's a lot from the Winklevosses who Mark wishes didn't exist at all. Um, but the reality is this is the story from one side in a lot of ways, and then it becomes Mark's story as we built the movie. And then we take the book, and it basically spreads out, and Aaron Sorkin sees it. Aaron Sorkin says, I want to make a movie out of this. He comes to Boston. We sit in a hotel room. Aaron had never seen Facebook. He didn't even know what a Mac Air was when I met him. Uh, he actually didn't know how to hook an Ethernet port into anything. So he knew nothing about it. But what his idea was, which I thought was brilliant, is it didn't have to be Facebook. This was really a story about entrepreneurship, about a bunch of kids in a college setting who build something great. And the movie The Social Network, I think, captured that. It could have been about anything in this sort of modern time. You know, two college kids in a dorm room. And I talk to entrepreneurs this all the time. I talk to venture capitalists. Two best friends in a dorm room. You come up with an idea. You say, I'll get 50%. You'll get 50%. And then you go off and you build the company. You spend three years building it. It becomes this incredible thing. It's suddenly worth billions of billions of dollars. And then your best friend comes back to you and says, OK, I want my 50%. Well, what does he deserve? And when you ask entrepreneurs that, they basically say he deserves nothing. He didn't do anything. But when you ask venture capitalists that, they say he deserves 50%. <laughs> so that really is the difference uh, of, of how these things happen.